Buenas tardes o buenas noches. Es un orgullo y un placer que el doctor Tony Bates comparta con nosotros este espacio en el Congreso de UTEC 2021. En esta oportunidad, la conferencia que nos ofrecerá se titula New Technologies and Their Impact on Teaching and Learning. Es difícil sintetizar en pocas palabras su vasta trayectoria conocida por varios de la audiencia. El doctor Bates es Senior Advisor de la Escuela de Formación Continua Chan de Ryerson University, Toronto, y también es investigador asociado de Contact North Ontario. Es el presidente del Comité de la Asociación Canadiense de Investigación de Educación Digital. Fue miembro fundador de la British Open University y profesor titular e investigador de medios educativos. En 1989 fue designado director ejecutivo de Planeamiento Estratégico y Tecnologías de la Información en la Open Learning Agency, Vancouver. Desde 1995 a 2003 se desempeñó como director de Educación a Distancia y Tecnología en la University British Columbia. Trabajó como consultor en diseño y gestión de educación a distancia y en línea en más de 40 países. Es autor de 12 libros, entre los que se encuentra su último libro abierto y en línea para docentes, maestros e instructores, Teaching in a Digital Age, que ya tiene más de 500.000 descargas y fue traducido a 10 idiomas. La traducción al español, enseñar en la era digital, estuvo a cargo de un integrante del Centro de Tecnologías Educativas de la Facultad de Ingeniería de la UBA, la traductora y profesora Fabiana Vega. Para que quienes quieran escuchar directamente a Tony y con el objetivo de administrar mejor los tiempos, la conferencia fue grabada previamente y subtitulada al español. Pero el doctor Bates, como aquí vemos, nos está acompañando y al finalizar responderá en vivo todas las preguntas que formule nuestra audiencia por el, por el chat y en, el, y en español. Para ello nos acompaña la traductora e intérprete Victoria Pérez. Disfrutemos entonces de su conferencia. Muchas gracias, Emma. I am very pleased to be able to talk to you from, from Vancouver. Um, I know you have some very interesting projects in Argentina, and I hope you will enjoy the video that's coming, and I look forward to answering your questions after the video. Many thanks, Tony. Bueno, muchas gracias por recibirme. Estoy muy feliz de estar aquí con ustedes desde Vancouver. Eh, sé que en Argentina tienen eh, proyectos muy interesantes, así que espero que les guste este video y luego espero eh, poder responder sus preguntas. Hello everyone. I'm very pleased to participate in the EduTech conference this year especially given the difficult circumstances we're in. I want to talk about new learning technologies because COVID-19 has shown us the, the value of online learning and the importance of having the appropriate technology. In this overview, talking about the hype and the reality about new technology, what the key trends are with, with technologies in teaching and learning, I want to talk about the difference between synchronous and asynchronous learning and technologies. I'm going to talk about some simple technology, uh, modern technology, new technologies that's very simple to use. Um, I'm going to talk about emerging technologies that are not so much in use at the moment, but some of which I think will be. I'm going to talk about the relationship between technology and assessment of students. Then I'm going to talk about the issue of how we choose which technologies to use and end up with some conclusions. New technologies are constantly emerging and the Gartner Consulting Company has come up with a very useful graph that gives a general overview of what happens when new technology comes in. Uh, you'll see from the graph that uh, when a new technology comes in it gets a lot of hype, it gets a lot of publicity, Um, and it reaches what's called a peak of inflated expectations. People make claims for it that in reality just don't turn out. And as people start to use the technology and find out what its limitations are, uh, the expectations gets, uh, goes right down and you get a trough of disillusionment. 
And then what generally happens then is that people find the niche of that technology, what it does really well. Um, so then you get up, go up the slope of enlightenment and eventually it finds its place with all the other technologies and the things that we do and reaches what's called a plateau of productivity. And we've, we've got some very good instances of that in online learning. I think uh, massive open online courses are a very good example of that. But this is from the business community and education is different from business. So we need, even though uh, a technology might have reached a plateau of productivity in the business sector, it's still got to be tested out in education to see if it meets the requirements of education. And what this means, of course, is that for most instru instructors, they tend to be what's called late adopters rather than early adopters of new technology. But at the same time, it's important that instructors should explore uh, new technologies, preferably when a lot of the kinks have been worked out. A um, good example of that is Zoom and the concerns about security took a while for Zoom to get that, uh, to nail that down, but now it's a pretty secure platform. Um, but uh, it was important that instructors uh, experimented with Zoom very early on, because without that, it would have been very difficult to have moved online during COVID-19. Now, are we in a world of Zoom? Uh, I'll give you some data here from Canada. Uh, in 2019, the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association did a survey of all Canadian universities and colleges. And they found that 93% of them were using a learning management system or a virtual learning environment. And only 63% were using video conferencing. This is for online courses. Um, in the middle of uh, COVID-19, around about July, uh, Quality Matters, an American organization, did a study and they found that 97% of institutions were using a learning management system and 88% were using conferencing. So there was obviously a small increase in learning management systems because it was almost at full capacity already, but video conferencing jumped up by 25% as a result of COVID-19. Um, and I have to be careful here because they're different surveys with different sample bases, but I, I think that pretty well reflects the actual situation. So we've seen a big jump in the use of uh, video conferencing technologies such as Zoom for online learning as a result of COVID-19. And this brings us to a distinction between synchronous and asynchronous learning. Why was Zoom so popular with instructors during COVID-19? Well, first of all, it's easy for most instructors to use. It, it's, uh, it can be used on virtually any platform, uh, Android or Mac. Uh, it can be used on iPads, iPhones, uh, tablets, uh, or, or full computers. And when it's broadcast live and uh, students are watching at the same time as the instructor, it's a synchronous technology. However, it can also, like many synchronous technologies, also be recorded and at which point it becomes asynchronous because once it's recorded, anyone can download it at any time if it's publicly available. And there's little change for instructors uh, or there was little change for instructors when they moved to it. They, they, they were used to doing lectures, so they carried on doing lectures. They didn't have to change their teaching approach or their teaching methodology. Um, so it's easy to move immediately and within a two-week period from fully face-to-face -to, -face to fully online. But it's mainly good for content delivery. Um, that's how it's being used anyway. Um, it's, it's being used for lectures primarily. Now a learning management system like Moodle or Blackboard or Canvas uh, called virtual learning environments in other countries, uh, in some countries, uh, these are asynchronous. Uh, now, until Zoom came along, this would be the core of most online courses. This is where students will go to every day for their studies. 
Um, and that meant, of course, that because it's asynchronous, it's very convenient. Students can access it whenever they want and at any, any place they want. Um, if they've got their mobile phone or some other tablet or a computer with them. And to be honest, in the past it's been used for more active learning than Zoom. Uh, there's a lot of passive listening to Zoom, whereas with, um, on, with asynchronous learning management systems there are activities built in, you have to do stuff all the time if you're in the learning management system, even if it's just page turning. And it's a bigger change for instructors moving to asynchronous teaching, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. And as a result, it facilitates course redesign, and it's designed for individual students working individually in, on their own, although you can build in uh, discussion forums and social communication. But it's primarily a tool for an individual student to work on their own. So they have much more control over the learning environment than they do in a Zoom conference. Now, both synchronous and asynchronous tools have value. But I'm going to argue that for online learning, uh, the, the asynchronous nature of the tools that are asynchronous have a big advantage over tools. The other te technologies I want to talk about are simple, easy to use, free technologies. Uh, free in the sense that people are already like to have this te technology often in their pockets. And mobile phones are the best example of this, although iPads and so on can be a little bit better for slightly higher quality and so on. So mobile phones allow simple videos to be made by instructors. The one on the right here is a video of a plastinated model of a dog's heart which is uh, which the, the instructor, she just took the model, um, took it apart, videoed it uh, on her mobile phone, and then she's used a QR code there so students can photo the QR code and upload the video um, from the university server. So that's a very simple use of, of video. She did that on her own without any technical support. It took her about an, an hour, she said, to really man manage the handling of it so that she could actually get clear pictures and so on. And she did a little bit of editing, um, but generally she did it in more or less one shot. So that's what I mean by a simple video. And then there are existing apps like Google Earth that can be used in a number of subject areas where you can actually go in and see things and uh, use, uh, see them in real time as well. Then you can use uh, mobile phones for interviews, for instance. You can do audio or video interviews. Um, so you could go out and interview experts in the field, for instance. Uh, one common use is when a visiting professor comes through and you uh, want to capture their expertise and build it into your course. You just take a, uh, an audio interview. Then there are student projects. Students can use these simple media. In fact, they probably use them better than you can. And so in some courses, for instance, students might make a, their own YouTube video of an elevator pitch for a, a businessman where they can encapsulate the, the product idea in a two-minute video. And it, also students are using video in their teaching practice to record what they've done and then go back and analyze it afterwards. So mobile phones have a, a lot of potential use and I'm going to argue it's very much underused the potential of these simple tools. And then there are blogs and wikis that uh, both can be, you can have both a course wiki or a course blog or a student blog or a wiki. If you're not sure what a wiki is, it's, it's a collaborative tool. It, it's like, like having an individual blog that you can post, but um, it, it, it's a group one, so several people can contribute to it and edit it. And at the University of British Columbia, John Beasley Murray, for instance, uh, used uh, blogs and wikis on his Latin American course. See, uh, the students could post their own blogs, but they also did a public wiki in order to get uh, input from people outside the course, and particularly from people in Latin America. And because it's public and out on the web, and if you put, use the right kind of terms when people are searching for stuff, they'll come across this by accident and can actually contribute to it. 
And then there's the use of e-portfolios, and I'll say a bit more about those later. That the, these are uh, digital collections of student work uh, that they can edit and put together, uh, and can, that can be used either for their, uh, their own study purposes or even for assessment purposes. So that's um, the use of simple existing technologies that could be used in teaching and learning. But I think we need to assess new and emerging technologies. Um, and I'm going to give four examples here of, of new technologies that are not widespread, in widespread use in education yet, but have what I consider to be uh, massive potential for education. So I'm going to look at video and simulations, uh, then serious games, virtual and augmented reality, and learning analytics and artificial intelligence. And what I'm going to do is to define each one, give some examples, talk about the affordances, which are really the strengths and weaknesses of each of these tools for teaching and learning. The first example I'm going to show is a simulation. Um, this is demonstrating how a normal curve of distribution is formed. It, it's, it, once you have that piece of equipment, it's not a difficult thing to do, um, but, and it's a very nice ex uh, concrete example of what for many students is a fairly abstract principle, is how a normal curve of distribution is formed. So what are the educational affordances of video, video simulations such as that? Well, they provide concrete examples of abstract ideas. Um, the video demonstrates the concrete aspect and the voice or the audio explains. In, in some ways, the academic analysis is the audio part, although a, a good video will probably capture the abstract ideas as well, the, the video part as well. But often, what, what the uh, voice is doing is interpreting what's happening and explaining what's happening. And this combination of visual and audio, the res research has showed, leads to deeper understanding of such concepts. Uh, once you've got that concept of a normal curve of distribution, then as the mathematics gets added to it about standard deviations and so on, it's much easier for students to understand that. Um, so video simulations are useful for showing processes and for showing procedures and so on. Um, or to show how things actually happen in real time. If these are created as open educational resources, then they can be widely available for anyone to use in their teaching. Uh, look out for a Creative Commons license on this materials, which means it's, it's free to use for educational or non-profit purposes. Another emerging technology are serious games. Now these have been around for a long time, actually. They've been around for about 15 to 20 years. But <clears throat> recently there's been some development on the educational side. The games have been around, video games, for 20 years. But their applications to education has been limited. Uh, and there's three aspects of them. There's the actual games, the ones that students play uh, to learn. There's game-based learning, that's the pedagogy of games. What people have done is to take the factors that motivate students to play games and apply that to, to learning. And then there's the gamification, which are the principles um, of using games, but maybe used in a, a non-gaming context. Um, an example might be taking a, a regular student activity and giving points and uh, getting students to compete and allowing them to go back and keep doing it until they get to 100%, for instance. Um, so you haven't actually got a game, you've just given kind of rewards, which is using the, some of the principles within gamification. And this is for a course for home social work, for social workers, and it describes a home visit. This is a very tricky thing to teach because Often uh, social workers have to go into difficult situations and this is an example of a game where the students have to make a choice of what they should do in particular circumstances. What are the correct procedures to follow here? 
Now Ryerson University has been doing research into serious games and they've identified some core design principles behind serious games. First of all, you have to have a clear learning outcome or outcomes or clear learning goals that you're trying to achieve through the game. Then you have to tell a story. There has to be some kind of story to tell that um, drives the playing of the game. And then there's the actual playing of the game, what the student or learner has to do during the game. And then there's what the user experiences from that. Is it a satisfactory experience? Do they enjoy doing it? Uh, is it motivating for them? And you have to take account of all four of those things when designing an educational or serious game. Now, what are the affordances of serious games? Well, one is motivation and engagement. For instance, you can take a pretty dry academic subject like academic integrity and build a game out of it to make it more interesting so that students actually work all their way through it. Um, problem solving uh, helps students to uh, try solving a particular problem and then seeing what the outcome of their attempt at solving that problem was. Communication skills uh, enable them, them to work out the best way to communicate in a difficult situation, for instance. Decision making, what do I do next? Um, and authenticity, it, it adds a, a kind of emotional aspect. They can add an emotional aspect to learning that makes it much deeper. And I think there are many possible educational applications for games. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a technology that I think has not yet uh, reached its, its, its plateau of productivity. Another development is virtual and augmented reality. This is uh, immersive technology where uh, you go into a kind of false world but it reflects, it's meant to reflect uh, the real world but in, uh, it replicates it. Um, and it combined with your actual actions. You do, learners can actually do things in this virtual world and there are responses from the software to what students do in that real world. So it enables students to identify, manipulate or analyze objects and provides a deeper, richer understanding of what's going on in those contexts. So it allows entry into otherwise dangerous or difficult environments or that will be difficult for them to manipulate in, in, in the real world, for instance. And I'll give some examples. It's been used in interactive molecular dynamics at the University of Bristol. It's been used to teach students how to conduct an orchestra. The orchestra is simulated, but as the uh, student uses the baton, for both pace and for direction, uh, the, 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 the orchestra responds appro uh, accordingly to the, the way the student uses the baton. Um, and it's been used in, for soil science sampling. Um, this is more augmented reality where uh, the student goes into the real world but has a number of tools on their mobile phone that uh, simulates what they're actually going into or provides, for instance, uh, graphics or uh, uh, location sites for the students. So they're combining uh, augmented realities where you combine real reality uh, with technolo te technology tools. So what are the affordances of augmented and virtual reality? In the chemistry case, it gave students deep intuitive understanding of phenomena. These were graduate students who were having problems in chemistry in coming up with intuitive hypotheses, uh, sort of a, a guess as to how, what would happen if you interrupted the normal structure of a chemical compound. Um, th they were good at deducting and they, if, if you did, did something and watch what happens and, and then they could deduce what happens, but knowing what, what initial um, intervention to make needs some kind of intuitive understanding. And that's what came out of that use of uh, 
uh, virtual reality for uh, the interactive chemical com compound. The students went in and changed things and then the whole chain reaction played out and they were right in the middle of that chain reaction watching what was happening. And it can be a substitute for dangerous or otherwise difficult training environments. Um, the, this is Tina, the avatar. She's a, she's a virtual patient in a hospital. This is from Drexel University. And nurses can interact with her. They can ask her questions. They can uh, reach out to touch her and so on. And she'll react appropriately. Um, she'll cry or she'll jump or she'll flinch. Um, depending on, on what you do. And this enables the nurses to explore and uh, try things out be, on, on a virtual patient without actually hurting or upsetting a real patient and getting the correct procedures and getting the feedback on what they did wrong and so on as a result. It enables you to practice in difficult contexts. Now, virtual and augmented reality is what I call a deep but, but narrow application of technology. Uh, it, it's, not, you, it's not something that's going to be used across the board in all subject areas. There are areas or uh, particular topics or particular learning outcomes that really lend themselves to this, but it doesn't lend itself to a lot of other things. For instance, it's not really good for teaching uh, abstract concepts. Uh, that, that that's probably much better done through text or something like that. But for procedures or uh, in difficult or uh, circumstances, it's, it's a good substitute. And in particular, it, it cuts down the time uh, on maybe expensive or difficult equipment to access, for instance, the training time on that. So it's not actually a replacement for hands-on, but it can actually reduce the hands-on time. Uh, learning analytics and artificial intelligence, these are, uh, learning analytics particularly is growing in education and artificial intelligence is becoming widespread outside of education. And there are three areas in education where it's been uh, artificial intelligence or learning analytics are being used. One is for institutional purposes. A good example is uh, using artificial intelligence to screen applicants for university um, to help the admissions process. And there, there have been problems with this because of inbuilt bias in the algorithms and so on. But this is one way it has been used. Uh, providing student support, not direct teaching, but providing feedback to students if they ask common questions, for instance, to save the instructor answering those questions. And less it's been used for direct instructional purposes. Now why are um, why is artificial intelligence and learning analytics considered important? Well one main reason of course is to lower labor costs. It, it, the, the hope of many people promoting artificial intelligence is it will cut down the amount of time that expensive instructors and teachers uh, will have to spend with students. So it's an attempt to increase output or effectiveness. And I'm bringing this up because there are a lot of problems in this area. The main area applications, as I said, are learning analytics. That's collecting data about students and using that data to, de to drive decision making. A clear example of the application of that to teaching would be to go back over three years of teaching and look at student uh, grades, for instance, on particular assignment questions and identify which are the ass assignment questions where students are having most difficulty. And that allows the instructor then to identify whether it's the wording of the question that's the problem or whether it's the actual teaching of the topic that's the problem. Uh, then the direct teaching has been so far mainly applied to things like intelligent tutoring systems. Uh, this is where um, students are given uh, stuff to learn and then they're tested on their comprehension and understanding and sometimes uh, on, on procedures and so on. And if they get it wrong, um, they're redirected back to the section of the course that they need um, to, in order to uh, try again until they master it. 
And uh, another more interesting use is the use of chatbots. Chatbots are um, pieces of software that roam an online dis uh, discussion forum or comments or chat chats um, and identifies common questions or comments. It, it does that by identifying the, the words around topics and so on and then provides extra feedback on, on those comments. Or it may just identify the most common questions asked and for instance in a MOOC with several thousand students it identifies which ones are the most common questions and directs those to the instructor who can then address them in the next uh, presentation of the MOOC. Its main use has really been for assessment and evaluation and it's quite good at doing quantitative assessment for, under, for measuring comprehension and understanding and it's also used, sometimes the term used is personalization of learning where it, it doesn't send all students back to do something again but only those students who are having problems with a particular concept and I have a lot of problems with this to be honest this kind of uh, use of computers is not really artificial intelligence. It's been around for ever since uh, uh, Skinner in the 1960s who brought in uh, 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 learning machines. Um, and it, it really is just, a, it doesn't deal with the more difficult aspects of learning uh, where there's interpretation or where there's alternative a range of possible alternative answers that the instructor can't anticipate which could be quite valid. So yes for straight memorization and comprehension it's fine but it, it's been limited so far. That's not to say artificial intelligence can't move into the other areas but it hasn't done so at the moment. Modern artificial intelligence has so far failed to deliver instructionally. Um, it's useful in some support areas, good for content delivery, memorization and testing, but no success yet in higher order skills development. That's not to say that it couldn't be useful there. Basically there's been little investment in education of the order that will be needed to drive that kind of use of technology for teaching. And I suspect that because it requires very large amounts of data and a kind of random sorting of that data in order to look for patterns and so on, that this is likely to happen outside the formal education system. It's going to be something that if the big high-tech companies really get interested in, they're the ones who are going to develop these uh, uh, higher order levels of artificial intelligence. And if they do that, I think everybody in the public education system needs to look out because governments will see this as a much cheaper but not necessarily more effective way of teaching um, at particularly at a post-secondary level. Now there's need for guidelines um, on the use of all these emerging technologies. What criteria should we use for making decisions? Um, and are we talking about technology or media? The two terms are often used interchangeably, but I make a distinction. I see technology as tools. Um, they, they sit there until somebody does something with them. Whereas a medium is a much richer. Uh, so I think we need to distinguish between media and technology, and I'll say a bit more about that in, in the moment. And then what we need to look for are what are these different media really good for and how do they differ from other media in doing this and in particularly in the educational context what are their educational affordances but also there are many other factors that you have to take into account not just the educational affordances although they're important but other factors like cost and convenience so let's look at media first um, there are four aspects of a medium first of all uh, somebody who creates creates content for the media. Secondly, the technology through which the medium flows. Thirdly, a receiver at the other end. And fourthly, and most important, some kind of message that goes through that. And I like to talk about media rather than 
technology because that allows us to look at face-to-face -face teaching as just another medium of teaching with a lot of other media that are around. Face-to-face -face teaching isn't a tool, it's a medium. You can think of the classroom, the physical classroom and the desks and the chairs and the whiteboard as the technology of face-to-face -face teaching. But a classroom that's empty without instructor and students is not a medium. So let's look at some of the technologies. Well, text has been a really important medium for teaching since the Renaissance. Uh, the big universities were create, created or expanded almost as a result of the printing press. And text is really important, and I'll come up to some of its uh, affordances in a moment. But a typical use of text uh, is books, newspapers, journals, etc. Then there are graphics. You see a graphic on the right. This is a visual representation of an abstract mathematical formula. So they can be uh, images, tables, pictures, cartoons, and so on. Then there's audio, and that comes in a number of uh, technolo technological forms. Uh, radio programs, cassettes, podcasts these days. Then there's video, movies, uh, YouTube, documentaries, talking heads, demonstrations, all kinds of uses of video besides elect delivering lectures. Then there's computing, uh, adaptive learning, artificial intelligence, animations, simulations, virtual reality. Um, in fact, you could break out some of those into their own media as they become more and more widely used. Then there's social media such as Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And then lastly there's face-to-face uh, uh, teaching, such as classroom teaching or tutorials. So what are the pedagogical affordances of the different media? Well, I've listed a lot of these in my book, and I can only give you a quick run over here, but text is very good for uh, abstract ideas. Uh, it, it's reproducible, you can uh, transmit it to many people through publishing the same idea in many copies of a book, for instance. It's uh, observable, you can uh, challenge it, it's, it's, it's there in front of you. Um, and it's been very useful as a, a, a pedagogical tool in, in certainly higher education. Graphics are good for visualization, for giving people another perspective on maybe a, a fairly abstract principles. Audio is very good for language learning, but also it can be very good for informal learning in the sense of giving students feedback. I use podcasts, for instance, to talk very um, casually to students about topics, uh, uh, about certain topics, particularly if there's a news item that is relevant to that topic. I can use a podcast, it's very quick and easy to do, and it's more informal than uh, a lecture or a presentation. Video is good for dynamic change, for showing processes and so on, and lots of different affordances for video. Computing is good for objective assessment and so on. Social media is very good for student collaboration. Um, again, as well as affordances, there are disadvantages as well. So you have to look at the, 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 the balance of uh, affordances versus disadvantages. And then there's the face-to-face teaching and that depends on the context and how you use face-to-face -face teaching but um, it can be very good for um, uh, group work for instance um, where the instructor is present and students have to think on their feet and one of the things I think the big challenge is now as more and more technology gets used in teaching we really have to focus on the specific affordances of face-to-face -face. what can it do better than other technologies can do and I think we haven't really identified that yet. And as I said, this is a work in, pro in, pro in progress. There's not a lot of agreement on these things, and there haven't been a lot of research and testing in the field. But I don't think we're actually going to be able to use technologies very well in education unless we are, have a better understanding of their affordances and their weaknesses in particular contexts. And that means then that we need to have a, a, a way of making judgments about different technologies and their use. And this is my own model, the sections model, um, and you'll see there are eight components of it. 
who are your students? Um, simple thing like, can they access this technology? Do they have access to this technology? It's no good using, no matter how powerful virtual reality is, if students don't have headsets or can't get into the, uh, a, a virtual reality studio, then it's not much use to them. How easy is it to, for both you as an instructor and for the students to use? If you have to have a lot of training on it, you're probably not going to use it. Uh, how much time does it take to create materials in this medium? Uh, how much, what's the cost of doing this? Is it really high cost? Then we come to the affordances of the media. What are the uh, in media characteristics and how well can you embed them in your instructional strategies? Um, what level of interaction does it provide between the student and the technology or the student and the instructor? What are the organizational issues? Uh, do you have to have a studio? Do you have access to the resources that you need, etc.? Um, will, the, will the institution or the accreditation agencies allow you to use this technology? Then there's networking. How well does it put students in contact with one another? Or does it allow you to go outside uh, uh, and network with the world, for instance? And lastly, and very importantly, how secure is this and how well does it enable you to, and, and students to manage privacy issues in it? And there's another model um, for media selection uh, by Puente, um, Ruben Puentadura called the SAMA model, which I find quite useful. Um, you can use technology as a straight substitution for something else. The best example of that is taking a lecture and putting it on Zoom. You're substituting the face-to-face -face environment with the online environment, but you haven't changed the teaching at all. And then there's augment augmentation, where technology acts as a direct tool substitute with some functional improvement. Sometimes you can use a PowerPoint slide to augment your lecture. You haven't changed the lecture, but you've augmented it with the technology. Then there's modification. You do actually do things somewhat differently in order to incorporate the technology. And then there's redefinition, where you completely change uh, and do something completely different that you wouldn't be able to have done if you, without the technology, which is a transformation then. And I find that can be used with the sections model. The section model really is a kind of before thing. Uh, should I use this technology? And I see the summer model as, a, as an after thing. Uh, where I, how far up this scale could I get with my teaching? And I don't believe there's a, a, what I would call a value judgment here. I'm, substitution, as in COVID-19, may be perfectly appropriate. Um, but you may be more ambitious and want to redefine your teaching, and then you would be going up for the top level of this model. And lastly, technology has an impact on new assessment methods. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about online proctoring, which many students and instructors have found intrusive. Uh, having a camera uh, in your living room recording everything that you do while you're taking an assessment. And I think the problem here is that we're focusing on the wrong issue here. What we're trying to do is to take uh, a, a 19th century form of assessment, paper and pencil, and move it to a digital environment. Uh, what we need to do is to change the way we assess learning. And the important thing about online learning is it allows student work to be continuously tracked. You can go in and see what students are doing if they're using a learning management system, for instance. You can see what activities they've done. You don't have to be evaluated even. You can have a spreadsheet with students' names along down the left-hand side and the activities across the top and just tick them, tick them off as you see them doing those activities. And if a student hasn't done any activity during a week, it's not an assessment thing. You can just send them an email and say, are you having problems? Uh, uh, I noticed you haven't done it. This is very good to keep them working, incidentally. But you could use it as an assessment tool if you wanted to as well. And I like this because I can see how students are developing during a course and I get a much better 
understanding of what they've done if they, than if they just done a written paper at the end. And it doesn't have to be either or. You, you, you can combine formative with, uh, con with a summative assessment at the end. But again, what we could be using are tools like ePortfolios, where students uh, are constantly adding to the ePortfolio and changing it and bringing it up to date. So the ePortfolio at the end of the course is far better than what they did at the beginning of the course. And again, you can track that progress and assess students on that. And that to me is a much more authentic way of assessing students than giving them a, a, a yes and no answer test or asking them to do stuff with a, a monitor in real time over a two hour period. So there are a number of teaching issues that come out of these emerging technologies. First of all, I think that multimedia and open education resources are grossly underused in teaching, particularly the higher education in the moment. Uh, content delivery has been used via Zoom rather than skills development. If we're looking at skills development, then I think multimedia have a lot of different uses. Instructors are doing the hard work here. Uh, st instructors are organizing the content, they're interpreting it, they're uh, delivering it to the students. And st students in that kind of teaching are relatively passive. Um, what we need to do is to get the students doing that work and using the technology to enable the students to do that. There are a few examples in emergency remote learning of dynamic video, games and simulations, and open education resources. So the move to um, emergency remote learning has led a number of instructors to experiment and innovate and I think that's excellent. The problem with a lot of these emerging technologies there are high development costs but also high learning returns. So you need a good business plan or a good funding strategy to do this. And I think in the public sector I think we need some provincial wide or statewide strategies for open education resources. We need quality education resources. That means good video production as well as good uh, instructional design. Uh, and that costs money. Uh, that means sharing the resources. Why can't we have common open education resources for all first year basic subjects taught through a, through a province or a state? Um, that means also flexible design in the open education resources. So for instance, you look in the top, uh, look, looking at the normal probability curve, uh, can you strip out or avoid putting in labels on the animation so that you could have both, you could have biology descriptors or you could have psychology descriptors or you could have mathematical descriptors, but the animation is to, of the normal curve of distribution remains the same. And the question then comes is who's going to pay for the development of such high quality resources? And I was, saw an interesting announcement from the Canadian federal government. They are putting money into the Colleges and Institutes Canada, uh, a large sum of money for um, developing skills. And I would like to see some of that money used for developing this kind of open educational resource that could be shared across all the colleges in Canada. So the problem at the moment is there's a lack of good quality, easy use, multimedia open education resources. And nearly all of it at the moment is in English. There is some in French, from France and so on, but basically it's an English language phenomenon. We need open education resources in other languages in other countries as well. Um, most at the moment are cheap and text-based. We need to move them into multimedia. Um, and we need to build national programs for open educational resource development. If we do that, we give the students resources to learn, free resources to learn. This is the equivalent of giving students uh, pencils and paper when they first went to school. This is the 21st century equivalent of giving them the digital resources they need to learn. So we've got many tools, but very little training, not so much in the tools, but in the pedagogical approaches needed to make for, take full advantage of the tools. And it means a shift in our teaching methods to more learner-centered teaching. So whatever technology we use, we need to first determine the learning goals. We need to work out an appropriate teaching method that exploits these tools. 
we need to identify the affordances of the tools and make sure they do what they, they can do best. And we need to have a method of selection so we get the right tools and the right media um, for whatever teaching purpose we have. So I don't think there's one killer application. Um, there are some technologies, I think, that are more universal, like learning management systems and Zoom, but there's no one technology that's going to solve all our problems. We're probably going to have to combine media. The one killer application will be better training of instructors to use technology for teaching. So there's lots of choice today, uh, and the costs of using technology have come down dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years. There's little research or theory, but we need that. We need more research about what works best and how to use media in their best ways. Uh, and we need some theory about uh, the affordances of different technologies. We need to learn linking, link learning outcomes, especially skills, uh, skills development to the affordances of different media to make sure we're using media to develop the skills we want in learners. And we have to understand that the learners themselves can now create media and they can do that to demonstrate their knowledge in richer ways than just paper and pencil tests. So technology is not the problem. We have lots of technology. The real problem is we need better instructor training in learning design in order to fully exploit the benefits of, techn of technology. We have a, we're probably going to need a combination of different tools with different affordances depending on the context in which they're being used. And we need to ask that fundamental question of what can face-to-face -face, face -face teaching do better um, than what can be done through the use of tools that may be more convenient for students to use. What is the uniqueness of face-to-face -face teaching and why are we fully exploiting that when students come to class? So to wrap up, um, there are some general questions for discussion, but I hope you'll come up with your own. Uh, if you want to contact me, that's my contact address, and I have a website. Thank you very much for this. Bueno, muchas gracias. Realmente muy interesante todo lo que nos decís, Tony. Y realmente, bueno, eh, eh, ahora se abre un espacio para preguntas más o menos alrededor de 30 minutos. Así que eh, todos los que están participando de esta conferencia les pedimos que dejen en el chat en español las preguntas. Nos acompaña, por eso, un intérprete que va a leer la pregunta en inglés y va a traducir lo que nos dice Tony. Así que, por favor, les pido que vayan dejando sus preguntas y que enriquezca realmente esta conferencia. Thank you very much, Tony. That was very, very interesting. So now we're going to open up a space for a questions and answer session of about 30 minutes uh, for all the participants to ask the questions they need. Uh, we have a chat box to the side so you can uh, ask the questions in Spanish and we have an interpreter who's going to translate them for Tony to answer them. Uh, please ask questions that will enrich our presentation. Thank you. Bueno, acá tengo una pregunta eh, que formulan si existen consorcios que eh, están produciendo recursos abiertos eh, para la educación, ¿no es cierto? O sea, que no estén circunscriptos, como dijo Tony, solamente, por ejemplo, a Canadá. ¿No? Es decir, que sería muy importante eso para poder compartir. So we have one question here. Uh, if there is um, any kind of consortium that is producing open resources for education, I mean, for example, not only in Canada, but uh, that will be a, a very important resource to share with everybody. Uh, I think there's lots of areas for research here. If I've understood the question properly, what are the key areas for research in this field? Um, I've mentioned the affordances of different media. Uh, what do they do best? In what circumstance? The problem with affordances is that they are they they are context specific. What works in engineering isn't necessarily 
going to be useful in teaching philosophy, for instance, or vice versa. So you have to look within the subject disciplines and particularly in terms of what kind of learning outcomes you're trying to get to identify what are the um, affordances. And in particular, sometimes the technology allows you to reach different affordances than you can do without using the technology. So in other words, you can be more ambitious in your learning outcomes if you have the right technology. So I, I think this is one area where I'd really like to see a lot more research than, than is happening at the moment. Bueno, eh, en realidad hay muchas áreas en las que podemos investigar, si, si entendí correctamente la pregunta. Eh, hay eh, ciertos campos que requieren mucha investigación. Actualmente nos debemos enfocar en las potencialidades de cada forma de enseñanza y qué es eh, lo mejor para utilizar con cada eh, tema o cada eh, materia, eh, debemos ajustarnos a las circunstancias. Eh, el problema de las potencialidades es que siempre depende del, del contexto, no es lo mismo las potencialidades para la enseñanza en ingeniería que para enseñar una clase de filosofía. Entonces, tenemos que enfocarnos en cuáles son las materias que estamos enseñando. Eh, debemos identificar estos potenciales y estas potencialidades, perdón, y eh, debemos... Eh, buscar la tecnología que sea más correcta y las tecnologías en general nos permiten ser más ambiciosos para poder adaptarnos a cada uno de estos sectores. Esa es una de las áreas que creo que son más importantes para investigar actualmente. Muchas gracias. Acá hay otra pregunta. ¿Cuál cree que es la duración ideal de una clase en video? Here we have another question. So, what do you think would be the ideal length of a video lecture? <laughs> Um, zero seconds. <laughs> Sería de cero segundos. Uh, I think that video uh, has many more useful applications than delivering content. Uh, there is a lot of research. This is one area where there has been a good deal of research. And it's to do with what's called cognitive overload. How much information can a student take in over a period of time? and tension and ability to process the information drops very rapidly after 15 minutes. Um, in a lecture, you know, real person lecture hall, that might be different because it depends on how the lecture is delivered, but if the instructor keeps asking questions, it breaks up the presentation and so on. But generally 15 minutes is considered to be the maximum for a video program. Um, It's not to say you, you can't learn after that. Um, it's useful if you have an extended argument and you're trying to build lots of evidence for that argument over a period of, uh, uh, you know, 40 minutes, then, then yes. But generally, for most lectures, uh, television is not a very good medium. You're much better in a classroom doing that than doing it by video. There are so many other uses of video that are much more interesting than using it for lectures. Eh, bueno, no, en realidad eh, el video se puede usar para muchos otras, muchas otras eh, potencialidades, no solo para eh, ofrecer contenido y dar clases de contenido. Hay, de hecho, muchas investigaciones con respecto al uso de los videos para dar clases y hay que tener mucho cuidado con respecto a la posibilidad de eh, sobrecargar a los alumnos con todo el trabajo que deben hacer. Eh, tenemos que tener en cuenta eh, cuánto tiempo se puede permanecer eh, eh, recibiendo información y cuánto dura el proceso de aprendizaje que es, tiende a caer mucho luego de 15 minutos. Entonces, eh, bueno, es eh, muy diferente dar una clase en persona que darla eh, a través de un video. Un, eh, en persona el instructor en general hace preguntas, mantiene a los alumnos eh, atentos, pero en general eh, se usa, se, se tiene en cuenta un tiempo máximo de 15 minutos para las clases en video. No quiero decir que después de esos 15 minutos no se puede aprender nada, sino que eh, es mejor hacerlo dentro de ese rango de tiempo. Eh, considero que, eh, digamos, la televisión no es el mejor medio para dar una clase. Y igualmente este es uno de los usos del de, eh, video como recurso. Hay muchos otros usos más interesantes también. Can I add a, a little bit extra to that? I'm talking about a live lecture uh, in real time. Um, recorded lectures, of course, students can stop and start them so they can take a break and come back and look at 
the next bit of the lecture and so on. So again, that's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. Asynchronous learning is much better for students than synchronous learning. Bueno, quiero agregar una, un detalle al final. Estoy hablando en este caso de las clases en vivo, en tiempo real. Eh, después tenemos por otro lado también la posibilidad de grabar las clases. Esto le permite a los alumnos volver a ver la clase, tomarse un recreo, seguir viéndola. Y aquí tenemos justamente lo que yo hablaba antes de la diferencia entre el aprendizaje sincrónico y asincrónico. El asincrónico es mucho más útil en este caso para los alumnos. Muchas gracias. Seguimos con las preguntas. ¿Es válido trasladar la clase expositiva presencial por Zoom sin tener en cuenta que es otro recurso? So, we continue with the questions. Here we have another one. Is it valid to move the face-to-face -face lecture to, to Zoom without considering that that's a different resource? Well, I think I sort of answered that in the previous question. Um, if you are going to move your lectures to Zoom, I would suggest that you break them up and have activities or questions after about 10 or 15 minutes and then another 10 or 15 minutes with questions and so on. Uh, the, I'm talking about teaching now rather than a conference. Conferences are somewhat different. Uh, you expect people to have a wider span of attention in a conference than you would in a classroom. So uh, again, if you're doing a lecture, think of it as being used asynchronously. So how would you then break it up and provide activities for students to do while they're working on their own? Because if they're usually going to be watching on their own and not in a group. Bueno, creo que ya respondí una parte de esa pregunta en la pregunta anterior. Eh, creo que si nos vamos a, vamos a migrar la clase a Zoom, lo importante es dividir la clase en varias partes, eh, preparar actividades para los alumnos, preparar preguntas cada 10 o 15 minutos aproximadamente para mantenerlos eh, eh, concentrados. Eh, esto estoy hablando, sí, de dar una clase no de dar una conferencia por Zoom, eh, que en el caso de las conferencias uno consideraría que la audiencia tiene posibilidad de eh, prestar atención por mucho más tiempo que en una clase. Entonces, la clase quisiera que la piensen como una tecnología asincrónica y que piensen cómo poder dividir esa clase y ofrecer actividades para los alumnos que van a estar haciendo esas actividades solos, porque en general si están viendo la clase de manera asincrónica no están con su propio grupo. Bien, muchas gracias. Acá preguntan, eh, en lo referente a exámenes, ¿no? Ha habido mucha producción de exámenes en este periodo de pandemia y realmente eh, ha habido algunos problemas de copia, ¿no? Entonces, no siempre se ha podido utilizar un sistema de proctoring adecuado. Eh, quisiera saber cuál es su opinión. All right. So uh, during the pandemic, we had uh, to assess students. You, we uh, had many exams and we had this problem, which was actually cheating. So uh, we weren't able to use always these uh, proctoring systems. So what is your opinion on this? Well, cheating is a problem always. It's not just an online problem. It's a problem generally. Um, we have, for instance, in face-to-face -face teaching, we have companies that sell answers to standard questions to students and they just reproduce them and that's got nothing to do with online learning so cheating will happen i i think i tried to explain in the presentation that um trying to take paper and pencil tests and move them online is a bit like taking a stagecoach and putting it on a railway line with horses in front it's an old-fashioned way of assessment we're only assessing you come back to the purpose of assessment Um, we're often assessing memorization and comprehension in our tests when we use paper and pencil tests, particularly multiple choice questions. And moving them online just makes the problem worse. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a problem that exists before you put them online, but putting them online makes it worse. It makes it easier for students to cheat with them. I come back to the point that we should be looking much more at skills development and not memorization of content. In other words, critical thinking rather than learning the dates in history. Um, 
designing a, a new product rather than just learning the mathematics of how tools work and so on in engineering. So it's a question of not only changing the assessment method, but also the goals of the assessment so that we're focusing much more on uh, what I will call higher level uh, thinking skills, such as critical thinking, creativity, innovation, and less on reproducing content. And the reason for that is you don't have to memorize things now. You just look it up. It's on Google. If you, if you want to know what the formula is for a particular thing, you can look it up now. You don't have to memorize it. What you do have to know is where to find that information, how to interpret and analyze it. And these are all skills. They're not learning content. So it's the assessment method that's the problem here, not the use of technology for assessing students. Bueno, eh, copiarse siempre fue un problema, no solo para el entorno en línea, sino también en las clases presenciales. Eh, muchas veces pasa que hay empresas que de hecho les venden las respuestas a los alumnos y eso no tiene nada que ver con el aprendizaje en línea. Eh, como dije en la presentación, eh, el, el tema es el modo de evaluación. Eh, si tomamos eh, la evaluación en, con papel y lápiz, es un método eh, muy anticuado. Es como no, no serviría en esta era. Eh, tenemos que nosotros con el, el papel y lápiz evaluamos la memorización y la comprensión del contenido, sobre todo con las preguntas de opción múltiple. Pero si eso lo migramos directamente al entorno en línea, es eh, mucho peor. La posibilidad de copiarse es mayor. Ya era un problema antes, pero pasa a ser mucho más fácil copiarse. Entonces, nos tenemos que enfocar en el desarrollo de habilidades, no simplemente la memorización del contenido. Tenemos que eh, ayudar a los eh, alumnos a aprender a pensar de manera crítica, más que aprenderse las fechas históricas de ciertos acontecimientos, por ejemplo. Eh, tenemos que aprender a desarrollar estas nuevas herramientas y no solo tenemos que cambiar el modo de evaluar a los alumnos, sino que tenemos que cambiar los objetivos del aprendizaje. No tenemos, nos tenemos que enfocar en el desarrollo de habilidades de orden superior, del pensamiento crítico, eh, creativo, innovador. No tenemos que simplemente pedirles a los alumnos que reproduzcan el contenido, eh, porque ya eh, cualquier fecha importante, cualquier fórmula se puede buscar en Google. Tenemos que eh, enseñarles a los alumnos lo importante que es saber dónde buscar esta información, cómo interpretarla y cómo analizarla. Entonces, es un desafío eh, cambiar este método de evaluación. Sí, eh, estamos de acuerdo con el doctor Tony Bates. El tema está cuando las aulas son masivas, por ejemplo, en materias que tienen 1.700 estudiantes, 2.000 estudiantes, eh, que algunas veces el seguimiento es complicado, ¿no? Entonces, algunas veces el contexto hace que la, este, que la evaluación quizás no sea la ideal. Yeah, well, again, the problem isn't... Uh whether it's done as a MOOC, uh, having 2,000 students in a class is a bad idea, full stop. It doesn't matter whether it's a MOOC or in a lecture theater. Um, you're not going to get a lot of interaction with the students. And, you know, le le learning is not just about stuffing things in people's heads. Um, it's much more about, it's a much more of a developmental process where people get some idea of a concept and then they gradually get more and more knowledge of that concept. And they do that usually through questioning and arguing and discussion. Um, and having a large lecture theatre doesn't, or having 2,000 people in a, in a MOOC doesn't help very much. Uh, we've seen that very, very few students complete MOOCs, for instance. The completion rate's around about 5%. The students who usually complete it already have a PhD or a very advanced level of education. So th this means of teaching, it's useful as a kind of continuing education, uh, as a way for somebody who's interested in a topic to, to learn more about it. But that's like educational television used to be. Uh, if you watch a, a history program on television, it doesn't make you a historian. You, you get to know a bit more about history, but it doesn't teach you how to be a good historian. Um, so you have to think about what the purpose of these programs or the purpose of the lecture is. Um, and I, I'm going to stop there for, to allow the translator to <laughs> translate what I've said. Thank you. So um, 
El problema es justamente que estas clases son de 1.700 o 2.000 personas. En esas clases eh, hay casi nada de interacción con los alumnos. El profesor no tiene interacción con los alumnos. Recordemos que el aprendizaje no solo es eh, meter conocimientos en la cabeza de los alumnos, sino es un tema que se va desarrollando. Se desarrolla una idea, se enseña esta idea y cada vez se tiene más conocimiento y se sabe más sobre ese eh, concepto o esa idea. En general, se hacen eh, preguntas, hay discusiones, y en las clases de 2.000 personas eso es muy difícil de hacer. De hecho, muy pocas personas, muy pocos de esos alumnos terminan el curso eh, completo, creo que eh, la cifra es alrededor del 5%, y en general son personas que ya tienen eh, títulos superiores de estudios avanzados, maestrías. Eh, es una forma de enseñanza útil como eh, educación continua para alguien que ya tiene una educación de base. Eh, repito, es como cuando miramos como si fuera educación en la televisión, miramos un programa de historia y, eh, bueno, eso no nos va a convertir en historiadores, sino que vamos a saber más sobre la historia, pero eso no, va, no quiere decir que seamos historiadores. Entonces, eh, tenemos que pensar eh, cuál es el objetivo de estas clases o de, estas, eh, de estos cursos y programas. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Acá hay otra pregunta que, ¿cómo usa la inteligencia artificial para evaluar? Porque en algún momento del video se habla de esto, que en Canadá se utilizó, perdón, la inteligencia artificial para evaluar. So, how do you use artificial intelligence for assessment? We saw that in your presentation that you are using this in Canada. Yes, well, I also said it wasn't being used very well for assessment. Um, again, it's really not artificial intelligence that's being used. It's computer marked assignments that are being used um, with maybe some adaptive learning added on. And as I said, redirecting students to relearn what they didn't learn properly in the first place. It, again, unless you provide some alternative to the original, the students are probably going to have the same problem when they go back to what the test directed them to. And I don't consider that a use of artificial intelligence for assessment. I think artificial intelligence for assessment would uh, require students maybe to do a project and then run that project against similar uh, projects that have been validated elsewhere and then assess how well that student uh, project stacks up, uh, compares with the with, with, with professional projects and so on. That would be, and, and to do that, you would have to analyze thousands of projects in that area in order to be able to come up with good models for assessment. That's not happening at the moment in um, higher education. We're not using artificial intelligence that way for assessment. Sí, eh, y también dije en el video sobre este uso de la inteligencia artificial que eh, no es eh, ese uso realmente de inteligencia artificial, sino que eh, son eh, evaluaciones eh, en donde las corrige directamente la computadora. También se le suma un poco de eh, aprendizaje adaptativo en el que se redirige al alumno a eh, volver a hacer lo que eh, no había comprendido de forma correcta. Eh, entonces, a menos que se encuentre una alternativa, seguimos teniendo el mismo problema. Este no es un uso de la inteligencia artificial para la evaluación, eh, sino que eh, yo diría que la inteligencia artificial para la evaluación implicaría que los alumnos desarrollen un proyecto y luego ese proyecto se compare con otros proyectos ya validados eh, profesionales y que se vea de esa forma, se compare cómo eh, funciona ese proyecto en relación con los otros. Eh, para eso, de todos modos, habría que analizar miles de proyectos para poder desarrollar un buen modelo y tener una pauta de cómo sería el proyecto correcto. Pero eso no es lo que está sucediendo actualmente acá con la inteligencia artificial. Muy bien. Muchas gracias. Eh, acá hay otra pregunta. ¿Se podrían dar clases de forma híbrida simultánea o si sea, alumnos en el aula al mismo tiempo que otros en su casa? Y si pasara eso, ¿cree que podría haber algún mayor beneficio en alguna de las modalidades? So, another question. Uh, what do you think about hybrid classes? I mean, uh, where we have simultaneously uh, students in the classroom and students taking the same uh, class at home. Do you think, in the case uh, that would be possible, do you think one would have one um, mode of uh, teaching would have uh, more benefits than the other one? 
Yeah, so we we take we we call these high flex classes in English. Um, I don't like them. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to teach the students who are in a classroom uh, to teach the students at a distance at the same time. And there are various reasons for that. First of all, the students are in a different context. Um, the students in a class are with the teacher and have other students around them. So you, the, the affordances there are different from the student studying online who's on their own and without a teacher there. We know from research that the students in, a, in the classroom get more attention from the teacher than the students who are online, for instance. So there are a number of reasons why I don't think this is a good model. You really need to redesign the, the teaching for individual students studying on their own. It's a different context than having the students in the classroom. It's like trying to um, ha have a piece of equipment that works well in one context, but is totally inappropriate in another context, but trying to force it into that context. Bien, en inglés eso lo llamamos clases high flex, híbridas flexibles. Eh, pero la verdad que no me parece una muy buena idea eh, tener alumnos en el aula, por un lado, y al mismo tiempo alumnos a distancia al mismo tiempo. Eh, y no me parece una buena idea por diferentes motivos. Eh, el primer motivo es que estamos en dos contextos muy diferentes. Eh, los alumnos que están en el aula tienen, eh, cuentan con la presencia del, del profesor, con la presencia de los demás alumnos. Entonces, las potencialidades de ese modo de enseñanza son diferentes que las potencialidades de la enseñanza en línea que eh, se les presenta a los alumnos que están viendo la clase solos, sin eh, el instructor ni los demás eh, alumnos. Eh, hay investigaciones que demostraron que los alumnos que están en clase en ese tipo de enseñanza reciben más atención del profesor que aquellos que están en línea. Entonces, lo que necesitamos hacer es rediseñar los métodos, rediseñar los programas para que puedan ser beneficiosos para los alumnos que están tomando la clase solos en su casa en un contexto muy diferente. Eh, sería como tomar un, una herramienta determinada que sea muy útil para un contexto en particular y aplicarla a otro contexto para el que es totalmente inadecuada. Muy bien. Bueno, hay varias preguntas. El modelo que nos presentaba sobre integración de, re, de herramientas, ¿en qué contextos los ha implementado o analizado? Y si puede compartirnos las dificultades experimentadas. So, in the presentation you talked about a model where you have um, resources implemented. Uh, how would you, um, sorry, excuse me, just a second. Sorry. Emma, ¿puedes repetir un segundo la pregunta? Sí, por supuesto. Eh, que el modelo que nos presentaba sobre integración de herramientas, ¿en qué contextos los ha implementado o analizado? Y si puede compartirnos las dificultades experimentadas. Thank you very much. Gracias. So, uh, this model of tool integration that you have uh, developed, have you analyzed it or implemented it? And if you have, um, what were the difficulties you uh, encountered? Um, I haven't, the, well, obviously I've implemented it in my own teaching, but I think more importantly, many other students have implemented the sections model in their own teaching. Um, I've had lots of students uh, come back to me and say they've used it in their teaching and it's been very helpful. So. Uh, there have been some research articles published on it, but m mostly it's personal experiences that, that I've heard about. Um, if, if I've understood the question correctly anyway, it was about how, uh, what evidence do I have that the sections model works? 
Um, bueno, tengo eh, con respecto a la aplicación de este modelo que se llama el modelo Sections, sections eh, tengo mi propia experiencia, yo lo enseñé en mis clases y también eh, lo enseñaron alumnos que yo tuve que, eh, bueno, han venido muchas veces a decirme que lo aplicaron en su propia enseñanza y que les resultó muy útil. Hay muchos artículos también eh, de investigaciones publicados, eh, pero me baso particularmente en la experiencia personal, si entendí bien la pregunta, que es sobre eh, las evidencias y las pruebas de que este modelo funciona. Bien, muy bien. Acá hay dos preguntas que dejaron en inglés. ¿Las queréis leer vos, Vicky, o te las leo yo? A ver, léelas vos porque no sé sí. de okay. cuál estás hablando. Eh, how can we manage the possibilities that the students have to learn eh, through the actual available technology if their economics reality are not the best we expect to find? Very good question. Um, we found during COVID-19, um, okay, prior to COVID-19, we always saw online learning as expanding access to education. I'll stop there and for the translation. Bueno, es una muy buena pregunta. Eh, antes de la pandemia, veíamos a la, el aprendizaje en línea como eh, una expansión del aprendizaje, como algo que se podía agregar al aprendizaje. This is because there were many students who could not get to campus on a regular basis. And for them, online learning, being asynchronous, so they could do it at any time, was much more flexible and suited their, suited their learning. Lo que sucedía es que había muchos alumnos que no podían llegar al campus de la universidad para poder estudiar. Eh, entonces, el aprendizaje en línea, asincrónico, fue mucho más flexible para ellos y más útil. But when we went to COVID-19 and everybody had to go online, then we found there were lots of problems. Luego, eh, bueno, cuando llegó el COVID, todos tuvieron que pasar al entorno en línea y descubrimos que hubo muchos problemas. Even in Canada, roughly 15% of students did not have adequate internet access. Incluso en Canadá descubrimos que alrededor del 15% de los alumnos no tenían un buen acceso a Internet. And about another 10% were living in conditions that made studying at home very difficult. E incluso otro 10% vivían en eh, hogares donde estudiar era muy difícil. And this was particularly true in the school sector. Eso pasó particularmente eh, mucho en el sector escolar. So what I learned from the COVID-19 experience is that online learning isn't a solution for everyone. It suits some people much better than others. Lo que descubrimos luego del COVID con la experiencia que tuvimos es que eh, el aprendizaje en línea no es una solución para todas las personas, sino para algunos sirve más que para otros. And in particular, it's not suitable for young children. Especialmente es eh, muy poco útil para los niños más pequeños. Um, it's not to say that it could not be integrated and used for certain things, like learning how to use a computer. That could be useful for young children. But generally, they need school. They need the social context of school. Um, and school needs to be open to everybody. Um, that's the great advantage of schools is that they are open to all, or they should be. And that allows even the poorest students access to education. Bueno, es muy eh, buena para integrar eh, algunos conocimientos. Um, pero los alumnos necesitan eh, en particular el, el contexto social, la interacción social. Por eso las escuelas deben estar abiertas para todos y esta es la gran ventaja de las escuelas en comparación con el aprendizaje en línea, que les permiten hasta las personas más pobres acceder a la educación. So I think even in post-secondary education, students should always have a choice about whether to attend on campus or to take a course online. There should be that choice there. It shouldn't be one or the other. 
Entonces creo sobre todo en el sector postsecundario, luego de la escuela secundaria, que los alumnos deberían tener la opción de tomar las clases en el campus, realmente presencialmente en la escuela, en la clase o en línea. Este debería ser eh, el mundo ideal y no debería ser eh, optar por una opción o la otra. And all institutions should recognize that there will be some students who will have financial difficulties in moving online. And so they should have a policy in place uh, in terms of how they're going to help such students. Y también todas las instituciones deberían reconocer que hay algunos alumnos que van a tener dificultades económicas para eh, acceder al aprendizaje en línea. Entonces deberían desarrollar también políticas para ayudar a estos alumnos en particular. I think that's it. Perfecto. Bueno, la última pregunta. Uh, how do you see the use of serious games for children and young people in a specific context such as hospital? Yes, I, I think serious games could be very useful in that particular context. Uh, I can see that particularly if you have to get children to learn how to take medicines or how to... Um, operate equipment that they need and so on. Um, I think a serious game could be a very useful way of teaching them those processes and procedures, but it would have to be very specific to the context and the task. But if, for instance, you have a uh, number, of, number of children every year coming in with the same difficulties, then it would be probably economically feasible to build a serious game where they could learn while in hospital Uh, how to carry out those procedures. I think that could be very useful, but it would be very specific. Bueno, eh, sí, los eh, juegos formativos son muy útiles para ese tipo de contexto. Los eh, niños pueden aprender, a, por ejemplo, a tomar medicación o a usar ciertos equipos. Entonces, es una forma muy útil de enseñar. Eh, también eh, tenemos que ser muy específicos con respecto al contexto o a la tarea que se está queriendo enseñar. Eh, porque, por ejemplo, si tenemos eh, una gran cantidad de niños que vienen todos los años y tienen las mismas dificultades, entonces, económicamente, es posible desarrollar un juego para esa, eh, ese tema específico. Pero bueno, justamente sería muy específico, hay que ser muy particular. Perfecto. Bueno, ya está cumplido el tiempo y bueno, me parece que eh, ha respondido la mayoría de las preguntas. Eh, igual este, se puede contactar, ¿no es cierto?, al doctor Tony Bess, que siempre es tan generoso. Eh, le agradecemos muchísimo por el tiempo, por compartir sus reflexiones sobre las tecnologías y su impacto en la enseñanza y el aprendizaje, y así a toda la audiencia por su participación en esta conferencia. All right, so uh, thank you for your time, Tony. You have answered uh, more or less all of our questions. Um, if you need to contact him, uh, you, he's very generous, so you can contact him whenever you want. And uh, well, again, thank you for your time, for your thoughts uh, on uh, the impact of technology in learning. Um, thank you for uh, the audience for being here. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm sorry I could not speak in Spanish. Um, I will try and learn it. Muchas gracias. And, uh, Muchas gracias a todos. Discúlpenme que no puedo hablar español, así que voy a tratar de aprender. Muchísimas gracias, Tony. Y bueno, y a todos les decimos que, bueno, eh, hoy por hoy damos finalizadas las actividades y mañana comenzamos a las nueve y media con las comunicaciones. ¿eh? Buenas tardes y buenas noches a todos. <música>